Okay, so uh, good morning today. I won't be speaking in uh, Spanish because we have other guests from uh, non -Spanish non-Spanish speaking countries. I will be speaking in English and thank you so much uh, Fabian uh, for, for the invitation to come here. Thank you all for receiving me and uh, the other colleagues from outside so well and really congratulations on a very excellent uh, meeting. So I will be speaking on uh, one of my favorite topics which is early diagnosis and prevention of IBD. And this is important because we know that uh, despite uh, IBD incidence seems to be stabilizing in high incidence countries, uh, there's still a rise in incidence in newly industrialized countries. And I, I guess this applies to Colombia, and I guess uh, in uh, Latin America, you will be witnessing an explosion of cases in the years to come. And so because IBD is diagnosed at a young age, it has a low mortality, it's expected that there will be an exponential increase in the number of patients with IBD living in the Western world over the next decade. And because of rapidly growing populations and rising incidence in newly industrialized countries, it's also expected that the number of patients in these countries will likely surpass even that of the Western world. So it's clear that IBD is becoming a global disease. And the, the, um, the, est the epidemiological estimates point that very soon, by 2030, uh, high incidence countries will have 1% of prevalence and we will have a major increase in the prevalence. And this will, of course, bring a huge burden to our healthcare systems and we, will, we are already starting to feel this in our clinical practices. So besides that, um, because patients get old, of course, we will also start to follow patients that are older, have uh, comorbidities, and so this will make the management of our drugs more challenging as well. So we need to um, acknowledge that we have had major advances in the management of IBD over the past years, but still, today we have no cure our current therapies fail to achieve remission in over 50% of patients. Our drugs are not, uh, they, have, uh, they have problems associated with toxicity, infections, and cancer. It's very uh, rarely possible that when we stop a drug that we keep the remission going, so drug-free remission is seldom possible. And of course, as well, we know that still disease has high surgery rates, disability, and mental health comorbidity. So we need to start thinking on another, on developing a new paradigm. And uh, yesterday and today we will be speaking a lot about tertiary prevention, so trying to improve disease course. But we also need to work towards primary and secondary prevention. So we should be able and we should work towards identifying those that we will develop IBD, early diagnosis of IBD, and potentially start to design preventive targets to reduce or attenuate IBD risk. And so uh, this is already uh, from 2016, and at the time it was very conceptual, but actually we have increasing evidence that IBD, like other immune-mediated disorders, has a preclinical period, so a pre-diagnosis period, where in the absence of symptoms, perhaps in the absence of any mucosal injury, dysregulated immune pathways altered intestinal permeability, dysbiosis, etc., are really setting the stage for disease to be later manifested. And so if we could understand what's going on in this pre-diagnosis period, we could potentially develop biomarkers for early diagnosis, and potentially we could design preventive targets where we could um, apply interventions. And I, I think this sounds very ambitious because we know IBD is a very complex disorder, but the fact is that it's already being done in other immune-mediated disorders. So here in the top, you have data from type 1 diabetes. And this is from the TEDI cohort on type 1 diabetes, mostly on children at risk for developing diabetes. And they have been able to develop a predictive model based on three variables that is able to predict the risk of type 1 diabetes with an accuracy over 90% by age 2. So I think this is pretty amazing. So it means that they can virtually predict every case of type 1 diabetes. And this is um, 
the results from a phase two randomized controlled trial that has been published in New England Journal of Medicine using teplizumab. This is an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody showing that it has been able to delay the onset for type 1 diabetes, and this is now ongoing phase three trials. And here in the bottom is a disease prevention trial from rheumatoid arthritis. Pa patients at risk for developing rheumatoid arthritis were given methotrexate or placebo, and essentially this was a negative trial, but the bottom line is that when they stratify the patients based on their uh, antibody status, they were able to see some differences in those that were uh, positive for anti-citrullinated antibodies. So implying that, you know, we need to work towards developing good stratification tools. So how can we then get access and understand, uh, better understand preclinical IBD? So essentially there are two ways of doing this. We can either follow asymptomatic at-risk individuals who are really the first degree relatives, and some studies have done so, and so they follow them until they develop IBD. Or we can identify IBD cases that have samples obtained before diagnosis, and we can then study these samples. And so many studies are doing this, and I will go through some of the results from these studies. And so this is a summary of some of these studies, the meconium study, the tooth fairy, the gem study, the predicts, etc. And what I think it's nice about these studies is that they target different stages of life. So for example, the meconium study is dedicated to understand pregnancy and the early life period as well as the tooth fairy study. And so if we are able to integrate the data from all these studies, I think one day we will be able to write the history of life before IBD and really understand what is going on before diagnosis. So the meconium study um, is a study looking at pregnant women with IBD and their children, and the goal is to try to understand how maternal IBD status affects the microbiome of the children, because there are many studies in other uh, disorders showing that the microbiome from the mom may affect the microbiome from the children, and that may put the children at risk for developing diseases later on. And so what the study does is that it recruits mothers with IBD and control mothers. It follows them throughout pregnancy, collects stool and saliva samples, and then after delivery, it follows prospectively the babies collecting cereal stool samples from these babies. So we, we usually say we have the largest collection of diapers in the world because we are following these kids until uh, age five. And so these are the results that we published a while ago uh, until age of three months from these babies. And essentially, this is the beta diversity, so the overall composition of the stool in these babies. We saw that there were two clusters uh, on the microbiome of these babies based on their maternal IBD status. So indeed, uh, suggesting that maternal IBD status influences the microbiome from these babies. So when we inoculated the stool from these babies in germ-free mice, we observed that there were differences in the immune system from these mice. So with a reduction in the proportion of class-switched memory B cells in the mesentery lymph nodes and in the lamina propria from these mice, implying that potentially altered microbiome can lead to altered uh, immune system development. And I don't know, maybe because of that, this is very, of course, speculative. We saw that uh, those babies, when followed longitudinally, uh, being born from an IBD mother after adjusting for antibiotic, mode of delivery, type of feeding, they had persistently higher fecal calprotectin as compared to the control babies. So you may ha have heard about the GEM study. This is a prospective study recruiting first-degree relatives from patients with Crohn's disease. It has recruited 5,000 healthy first-degree relatives, which is, I think, a major achievement across the world. Around 100 have developed disease, and they are starting to, to publish their results. And here they looked at intestinal permeability in those that eventually developed Crohn's disease. And as you can see, those that developed uh, Crohn's disease had a significantly higher intestinal permeability. So I think in showing that this may work as a biomarker, but also I think suggesting that this may work as a therapeutic target for prevention. Prevention. They also have looked at their antimicrobial um, antibodies, so a kind of immune response, showing that those individuals that had 
higher uh, baseline number of antibodies, so two or more, were at higher risk for developing Crohn's disease later on as well. So the PREDICT study uh, is a study that I have uh, the fortune to be involved. I think this is an amazing resource. This was started by Jean-Fred Colombel, who is, I think, a major mentor of this preclinical um, concept and uh, really pushing for disease prevention. And so this study takes advantage of an amazing resource, which is the Department of Defense Serum Repository in the United States. So briefly, once an individual gets enlisted into the Army or, or to the Navy or the Armed Forces, until 2013, they were mandated to take blood every two years, and those serum samples are stored in warehouses like this, and there are millions of serum samples, and only a small proportion has actually been used for research. So what we did was that we identified those individuals that developed incident IBD while in the active service through a combination of ICD-9 codes, and then we link them to the serum repository and we ret retrieve the serum sample around the time of diagnosis, and then every two years before until the earliest available sample, so up to three to four serum samples per individual. And this is just a, a list of some of the studies that we are currently performing, looking at uh, biomarkers for disease prediction, but also really trying to understand better disease pathogenesis before its diagnosis. So you can see we have a lot of data on proteome, serum antibodies, glycome, GMCSF antibody, we've just published these results, metabolome, exposome, et cetera. And so this was our, I think, first big paper, and the goal was to look into prediction. Uh, this was the, 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 the focus of this paper, and we looked into the antimicrobial antibodies and also into somologic. This is a platform that measures more than 1,000 proteins in the serum at the same time, and this is the area under the curve for these markers to predict disease uh, onset for Crohn's disease. And you can see that based on the antimicrobial antibodies, which is a set of six markers, the predictive accuracy was 69% at year five before diagnosis. And for the somologic, it was 76% uh, at year five before diagnosis. So I think this is already a very good predictive performance. And of course, we, because we were measuring so, uh, such a large number of markers, we were interested in looking into the pathways that these markers were um, mapping to. And so we conducted pathway analysis. And very interestingly, we found uh, that pathways upregulated in the years preceding Crohn's disease diagnosis were related to complement, innate immune system, autophagy, uh, lysosome, and also to glycosaminoglycan metabolism. So I think highlighting negative host microbiome interactions in the years preceding diagnosis. And of course, there is a lot of interest in understanding microbiome and microbiome interactions before diagnosis, microbiome um, the effect of microbiome in response to therapies, et cetera. But in my view, the microbiome is really um, at the interface before, b between the, our um, external environment and our inner mucosal system, right? So it's like a sensor of what we are exposed throughout our lives. And then this, this brings me to the exposome, and we all know the importance that the, the environment has in the development of IBD and development of Crohn's disease. So, and this is very difficult to study, and we have mostly kind of failed to address properly environmental exposures in the setting of IBD because it's very difficult to study. So when I was at Mount Sinai, there was uh, people in the environmental health department that had developed a special technique to look into uh, the exposures accumulated in teeth. And this is uh, related to baby teeth. And so teeth have been used for many years to assess differences in uh, heavy metals, et cetera. But basically, people just uh, kind of smash the teeth and then compare the, the, the proportions of whatever compound in the teeth. And what these investigators have made is that they have uh, taken advantage of the way that the teeth is developed. So teeth, the enamel and dentine, develop in concentric uh, rings, a little like the trees, the rings of the trees. And so th these investigators are able to go almost ring by ring, and so they are able to dissect the compounds in that 
ring of the teeth. And then because something very specific to baby teeth is that there is an histological line that forms during delivery, during labor, which is called the birth line, they are able not only to measure the differences, but also to assess the temporal, uh, the temporal differences. So it's like a hard drive of our uh, exposures, and it starts in the second trimester of life. So in Portugal, I've heard it's not so common in Colombia, but in Portugal, there is this tradition, or there was, to keep and store the baby teeth from the babies once they shed their baby teeth. Many people like to put it in rings or in necklaces. And so, because I knew this was uh, uh, something that was common in Portugal, when I came back to Portugal, I collected some baby teeth from my patients that still have them stored. We collected some baby teeth from my colleagues that had the baby teeth from their uh, children. And we kind of run a, a pilot study to see whether there were differences. And indeed, we found that there were differences in the exposure to lead, copper, zinc, and chromium. Already, the, the slide is not very clear, but this already started uh, Cope, um, lead was the strongest exposure, starting already in intrauterine life and going at least up to six months. And of course, this led us to develop a study, a larger study. We applied to a grant, and we have currently collected, uh, I think, over 150 participants. Uh, we have participants, of course, from Portugal. We have also collected some teeth from the twin cohort in Netherlands, so this will be interesting. And we have started now a collaboration in Brazil, which I think it's very interesting because this is a country that is suffering an epidemiological transition. For sure, it has a different environmental exposures as compared to Portugal. So now we just need to find some money to run our analysis. So what could be the clinical applications of this, right? I think this is very interesting, but at the same time that we are developing these studies, we need to start thinking how to apply them. And of course, the, the obvious one is to develop a prediction tool uh, that could, uh, where we could input data and also clinical data, family history data, and that would tell us the probability of developing disease. And indeed, if we could um, kind of stratify individuals at risk for developing IBD into low risk and high risk, we could then potentially start to think about developing disease prevention trials. And this is uh, some work we've done at ECHO in the... Um, scientific workshop into prediction and prevention. And this is just some ideas that we think, based on the current knowledge, that could be used for prevention. And uh, we, we uh, just published the GMCSF data. We will soon publish the data on glycans on the, on the PREDICT study. And this, uh, I've added those here because this could be very interesting um, targets as well. So we also need to acknowledge that there are many phenotypes of IBD. We have early onset IBD, pediatric IBD, late onset IBD. So we need to take this into consideration when we are thinking about prevention because probably this type of different phenotypes may have a different preclinical period. And by looking at what has been done in type 1 diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, I think we need to be very humble and think, you know, it may be difficult to, to complete abolish the risk for developed disease. But I think even um, implementing earlier diagnosis, uh, you know, kind of capturing the, the history of disease before it uh, starts with symptoms could be very, very helpful and improve outcomes. And there could be many outcomes from a prevention strategy, even disease delay, uh, disease attenuation, making the, the course of disease milder, I think could be beneficial for patients. So this is the MELODY trial. I think this is a primary prevention study. This takes advantage of the meconium infrastructure. And of course, the goal is not to prevent IBD in these children, but it's really to try to modulate their microbiome, their fecal coprotectin, through an intervention with an anti-inflammatory diet in the mothers. And we will have the results, I think, soon. So like I told you, the PREDICT study showed some pathways uh, uh, pa mapping to the glycome. And indeed, we are working with Salome uh, she, uh, Pingu from Portugal. She is a glycobiologist. She has shown that the, the glycan repertoire is different in those patients that developed Crohn's disease. We just got a big grant from uh, um, Europe uh, Horizon 2020 to further study uh, this, uh, this topic. So hopefully we will find something. <clears throat> 
So I will conclude by saying that indeed IBD is increasing across the world. So I think this will bring a huge burden to healthcare systems. It will exacerbate disparity of care. We need new strategies. Preliminary evidence suggests that IBD may be predicted in the years before diagnosis. So we do need better risk stratification. We know that even in the high risk population, the first degree relatives, only a small proportion will develop IBD. So we need to risk stratify these people. And hopefully, one day we will be able uh, to apply prevention strategies that offer the opportunity to truly modify the disease course and disease outcomes. And this is to show that there is an increasing number of people interested in this topic. Uh, so uh, I hope that this group continues to rise, and I think it's very important to include countries with a rising incidence uh, of IBD because this is truly an opportunity to intervene in these countries. So hopefully we will be able to col collaborate uh, with Latin America, Asia, etc. So thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, doctora Joana Torres, por su excelente presentación y por compartir el resultado de sus investigaciones. Entonces, a continuación, entonces a continuación eh, le damos la bienvenida al doctor Fabián Juliado, nuestro presidente y líder nacional y latinoamericano de enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal con eh, la, conferencia de tratamiento, eh, la conferencia de tratamiento de colitis ulcerativa, ¿qué dicen las nuevas guías de PANCO? Bienvenido, doctor Julián. Dale, dale. Muchas gracias, doctor Gil, eh, por la presentación. Eh, mil gracias a todos por estar acá en, en este evento bien importante para la gastroenterología colombiana. Y me toca presentar la charla sobre tratamiento colitis ulcerativa que dicen las nuevas de, guías de PANCO. Recuerden que PANCO es la Organización Panamericana de Crohn y Colitis Ulcerativa, eh, de la cual pues, hay representantes acá en Colombia. Lo primero que vamos a mencionar es que, así como decía la doctora Joana, eh, la enfermedad inflamatoria está aumentando en el mundo, pero en esta revisión sistemática que tuve la oportunidad de participar, liderada por el doctor Pablo Coxe, se ve que también en Latinoamérica está incrementando. Hay aumento de la prevalencia e incidencia tanto de Crohn como en colitis ulcerativa, como pueden ver acá. Definitivamente, la que predomina, el tipo de, 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 de enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal que predomina en Latinoamérica es colitis ulcerativa. Eh, eso ha venido cambiando, pero más o menos en promedio eh, de cinco pacientes por, de colitis ulcerativa tenemos un paciente con enfermedad de Crohn. En nuestro hospital hemos visto que esto se está cortando, cada vez tenemos más Crohn y hoy en día la proporción es de 2.7 a 1. O sea, estamos diagnosticando más enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal, pero proporcionalmente más enfermedad de Crohn que colitis ulcerativa. Muchos dicen, no, pues la colitis ulcerativa es fácil, la enfermedad de Crohn es más complicado, pero miren que no. Alrededor de un 30, 40% de los pacientes con colitis ulcerativa que tienen proctitis o colitis izquierda se van a extender. La tasa de recaída a 10 años es de un 67 a un 80%, la tasa de hospitalización alrededor de un 50%, tasa de colectomía a 10 años alrededor de 8, entre 8.5 a 11% y también tenemos el riesgo de cáncer colorectal con el tiempo. Entonces, es una enfermedad que amerita también mucho seguimiento y mucha atención. Teniendo en cuenta todo esto, nosotros actualizamos la guía de la práctica clínica de PANCO para el tratamiento de la colitis ulcerativa. Tenemos representantes de todos los países de Latinoamérica. Tuve la oportunidad de liderar este proceso y se publicó este mes en la revista mexicana de gastroenterología. Anteriormente habíamos hecho un consenso, esta vez hicimos una guía que son conceptos un poco diferentes. El consenso lo había liderado el doctor Jesús Yamamoto, que va a estar con nosotros también en este evento. Lo primero que tuvimos en cuenta es clasificar, estratificar y definir objetivos terapéuticos. En eso es lo que más ha cambiado. Y hay un síntoma que nos llama mucho la atención, que es lo de la urgencia intestinal. Miren este estudio bien bonito de, de David Rubin, eh, publicado el año pasado, donde los pacientes lo que más les preocupa es la urgencia rectal. Y a nosotros como médicos lo que nos más, más nos preocupa es como la diarrea con sangre. Entonces miren los conceptos y, la, y la, la, las prioridades en cuanto al tratamiento desde el punto de vista médico y desde el punto de vista del paciente. Adicionalmente, pues conservamos la clasificación de Montreal en, en proctitis, colitis izquierda y cuando es más allá, colitis extensa. 
eh, in, eh, consideramos muy importante tener índices de actividad endoscópica y en, en esto soy muy estricto siempre con, con, con mis estudiantes, con los colegas, incluso de que siempre eh, clasifiquemos la severidad de colitis ulcerativa cuando hagamos un reporte de endoscopia. Yo uso la, el Mayo Score, que es el más fácil, es, es, está de 0, 1, 2 y 3. Y si es normal, 0, obviamente si es más severo, friabilidad de la mucosa es 3. Pero siempre en el reporte incluirlo. Esto sirve para comparar con futuros estudios. No siempre nosotros mismos le tenemos que hacer el, el examen al paciente. Entonces, esto facilita que todos hablemos el mismo idioma. Adicionalmente, hay evidencia de que la calprotectina fecal, eh, si uno tiene valores por encima de 250, hay actividad endoscópica fija, eso es lo que han demostrado los estudios. Recuerden que la calprotectina es una proteína derivada del neutrófilo en, en, en estos procesos inflamatorios, no es exclusiva de enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. Entonces, no siempre que piense una diarrea infecciosa, invasiva, pues también puede aumentar la calprotectina. Pero, sin embargo, cuando hay menos de 150, habla de que hay cicatización mucosa y cuando la calprotectina está por debajo de 100, se asocia a cicatización histológica. Entonces, es un biomarcador muy importante, como mencionaba ayer la doctora Joana Torres. ¿Qué adoptamos nosotros en la guía de Panco? Entonces, ¿qué necesidades teníamos nuevas? Incluir la urgencia, incluir eh, calprotectina fecal, que en los lo anteriores criterios de and Witt no, no estaba e incluir un índice endoscópico. Por lo tanto, decidimos adoptar esta clasificación de severidad del American College Gastroenterology. Que a propósito, hay una de los autores, la doctora Mililón, que nos acompaña hoy en día. Lo otro es estratificación de riesgo. Es importante, siempre, ayer la doctora Joana también nos decía mucho, estratifique riesgo. Si ya ven paciente con Crohn que tiene mal pronóstico de entrada, se va con biológico, nos decía. Pues en colitis ulcerativa no están así, ayer preguntamos eso, pero, pero miren que un paciente con una extensión eh, anatómica limitada, proctitis, con un compromiso leve, de esos que uno con, con, con supositorio y todo maneja el paciente, es leve, pero si tienes colitis extensa, si tienes úlceras profundas, la edad, los jóvenes les va peor, si tienes BCG alta, proteína C reactiva alta, si tienes, eh, requieres esteroides de, de, de entrada, si tienes historia de hospitalización o infecciones por clostridium o citomegalovirus, son pacientes que son de alto riesgo. También el reciente consenso de STRAI lo tuvimos en cuenta también para este consenso, donde definitivamente la respuesta sintomática es lo que más queremos en forma inmediata, ya en respuesta intermedia, el, la remisión bioquímica, que es normalizar la PCR, normalizar la calprotectina, y más a largo plazo, obviamente, queremos que haya cicatización mucosa, que no haya discapacidad, y en esto es importante tener siempre en cuenta la calidad de vida de los pacientes, y a futuro, un cicatización histológica como un objetivo, un target eh, eh, a futuro bien interesante. ¿no? A mí me gusta la parte de la histológica porque no nos cuesta adicional. O sea, tú haces la, la, la colonoscopia, tomas biopsia, no hay que hacer otra cosa adicional, pero sí tienes que ponerte de acuerdo con el patólogo de que te reporte la actividad histológica y tú saber qué es lo que te está reportando el patólogo. Entonces, teniendo... Bueno, adicionalmente, en cuanto a los objetivos de tratamiento, la cicatrización mucosa es un objetivo ideal. Miren, los pacientes que logran cicatrización mucosa tienen 4.5 veces más de tener remisión de su colitis ulcerativa, remisión clínica. Los que hacen cicatrización mucosa tienen menos riesgo de colectomía y adicionalmente tienen menos riesgo de desarrollar cáncer colorectal. Todas las complicaciones que vemos que se dan en estos pacientes con colitis ulcerativa. Adicionalmente, si tiene cicatrización mucosa, pero además tiene cicatrización histológica, la tasa de recurrencia a un año va a ser menor. Si tiene solo cicatrización eh, mucosa, 14% recaída a un año. Si tienes además cicatrización histológica, va a ser de solo 5%. Ideal también tener cicatrización histológica. Ahora, que sea siempre lograble, probablemente no, que es lo que vemos con nuestro paciente. Entonces, ¿qué dice el consenso? El, el, dice recomendación fuerte a favor. Se recomienda que en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa se gradúe la actividad de la enfermedad mediante el uso de una escala que involucre un subpuntaje endoscópico. El grupo desarrollador de la guía se adhiere al índice desarrollado por el Colegio Americano de Gastroenterología, la gráfica que les mostré, para graduar la actividad de la enfermedad. El grupo desarrollador resalta que la importancia en el objetivo del tratamiento sea la remisión clínica, pero también la cicatrización mucosa. Y que la cicatrización histológica es un objetivo terapéutico deseable en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa. Entonces, eso, eso fueron los, el, la recomendación y los puntos de buena práctica. ¿Qué hay con respecto al tratamiento? Por evidencia, hemos visto que el 5 asa tópico en pacientes con proctitis ulcerativa para inducir y mantener remisión funciona, comparado con placebo, son mejores. 
Y para inducir remisión en colitis ulcerativa activa, independiente de la extensión, o sea, no solo proctitis, sino que en colitis izquierda, colitis extensa, los medicamentos 5-ASA en colitis ulcerativa leve a, a moderada funcionan, NNT de 6, número necesario tratar de 6. Lo otro es, independiente de la extensión, o sea, si es colitis izquierda o colitis eh, extensa, siempre en estos pacientes para inducir remisión es mejor usar 5-ASA oral combinado con 5-ASA tópico. Después de cuatro semanas, si el paciente mejora, pues el mantenimiento sí sigue con 5-ASA, el control de sangrado es mucho más rápido. ¿Qué se co colocamos en nuestra guía? Se recomienda el manejo con aminosalicilatos tópico rectal para inducir remisión clínica en pacientes con proctitis ulcerativa, la dosis de aminosalicilato tópico para inducir remisión se puede hacer de un gramo al día, o sea, pues un supositorio de 500 cada 12 horas. Se puede utilizar esteroides tópicos como terapia segunda línea en proctitis ulcerativa que tengan falla o intolerancia a medicamentos 5 ASA. Adicionalmente, recomendamos el manejo con aminosalicilatos orales para inducir remisión clínica y endoscópica en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa izquierda o extensa con actividad leve o moderada, según la clasificación que ya les mostré. La respuesta debe evaluarse después de 4 a 8 semanas. Si en 4 a 8 semanas el paciente no te mejora, tienes que cambiar, lo, lo que más o menos este, decía el stripe. La, la recomendación número 4, no la voy a mencionar toda, es un, es un artículo extenso, pero la más importante la vamos a ir mencionando. Se recomienda la combinación de aminosalicilatos tópico y oral para la inducción de remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa leve a moderada, izquierda o extensa. O sea, siempre que tenga actividad y sea extensa, independiente de la extensión, si es izquierda o extensa, siempre combinar oral y tópico. Recientemente salió una revisión sistemática donde ya el uso de budesonida MMX, Multimatic, recuerden que hay dos tipos de budesonida, una de liberación ileal, que se usa en Crohn y Leal, y otra que es budesonida MMX. Ojo, porque no son iguales, a veces trata uno de que sean iguales se la, a los pacientes en, en, su, en su asegurador, a veces tratan de, 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 de ser igual, no, esta viene por ejemplo de 9 miligramos, la de liberación ileal viene de 3 miligramos, y miren los estudios ocho semanas, este tres estudios, una revisión sistemática demuestra que son útiles, eh, mejor que placebo. Adicionalmente, este metaanálisis comparó todos los esquemas de inducción para remisión clínica en colitis leve a moderada. Ojo que es leve a moderada. La mejor, la mejor combinación es oral más rectal, la de mejor resultado. Le sigue budesonida MMX y siempre, lo que siempre le, le digo también a los residentes, que siempre nunca use menos de 3 gramos al día de mesalacina para inducir remisión. ¿okay? Para mantenimiento, 2 gramos al día, pero para inducir remisión, mínimo 3 gramos al día. De la presentación que usted quiera, en gránulo oral, en fin. ¿Qué dice la guía? Se recomienda el uso de esteroides orales para inducir remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa activa, moderada, severa, de cualquier extensión. Se sugiere el uso de budesonida MMX para la inducción de remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa de cualquier extensión. Recuerden que se recomienda, es mucho más fuerte cuando uno dice se sugiere. Y se puede utilizar budesonida MMX en pacientes con no respuesta a medicamentos sin coasa. Otras recomendaciones, condicional en contra, no se sugiere el trasplante de microbiota de materia fecal para inducción de remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa moderada, esto es un, un área en evolución. Y como punto de buena práctica colocamos que el trasplante de materia fecal debe hacerse en centros especializados en un eh, con experiencia en este procedimiento y como parte de un protocolo de investigación clínica, no ofrecerlo a todos los pacientes en ese momento. Lo otro que está de moda también es el uso de cannabis, no se sugiere el uso de cannabis para inducir remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa, lo que revisamos no demuestra eh, efe, eh, eficacia en, este, en esta indicación. Terapia biológica y pequeñas moléculas, entonces revisamos eh, esta revisión sistemática publicada por SIM en Clínica Gastroenterología en Hepatoli, donde demuestra que Adalimumab funciona comparado con placebo, Golimumab también para inducir remisión, Infliximab, Tofacitinib, Ustekinumab y Vedolizumab, o sea, todas comparadas con placebo funcionan. Sin embargo, en pacientes ya expuestos a anti-TNF, la mejor evidencia está con tofacitinib y con ustekinumab, y miren que con adalimumab no, ni con vedolizumab es más marginal. ¿Qué colocamos nosotros en la guía? Recomendación 19, fuerte a favor, se recomienda el uso de terapia biológica con antagonistas del factor de necrosis tumoral alfa, llámese innovador e incluso biosimilar, infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, 
inhibidor de antiintegrina, vedolizumab o interleuquina 1223 ustekinumab para inducir remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa, acá sí, moderada a severa. Fuerte a favor, se recomienda el uso de tofacitinib, inhibidor JAK, para inducir remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa moderada a severa. Condicional a favor, o sea, no es tan fuerte, se sugiere usar ustekinumab o tofa en pacientes ya expuestos a antitnf y si no tenemos, por ejemplo, acá en Colombia no tenemos ustekinumab, pues la opción, pues si el paciente tiene mucho riesgo, pues más de 65 años, factor de riesgo para, para eventos trombóticos, pues en esos pacientes vedolizumab podría ser también una opción. Este es el algoritmo terapéutico que utilizamos, entonces normalmente paciente con colitis ulcerativa activa, moderada, severa, usamos prendizona, nunca usamos más de 40 miligramos al día, por dos a cuatro semanas, 40, a las cuatro semanas revisamos qué ha pasado con el paciente, lo más rápido que queremos es que controle diarrea y sangrado y ojalá la urgencia. Si el paciente responde, suspendemos y lo dejamos en mantenimiento con 5 asa oral, 2 gramos al día. Si no responde, nunca usamos azatioprina, recuerden que se demora 3 meses en actuar, entonces en estos casos usamos anti-TNF, si es muy severa, y, pero si es moderada, hoy en día, y es lo que se, se sugirió en el consenso y lo que hago en, en, en mi práctica clínica, si es moderado, estamos usando vedolizumab. Eh, como no tenemos sequinumab, no tenemos experiencia con sequinumab. Si el paciente no responde a anti-TNF, como segunda opción vamos a tener tofacitinib, siempre y cuando pues, el perfil de seguridad del paciente eh, lo amerite. ¿Qué pasa en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa severa? Los esteroides intravenosos eh, funcionan, miren el NNT es de 3, son muy buenas drogas para inducir remisión en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa aguda severa. Y eso lo ve uno en, 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 en la práctica, en los pacientes cuando llegan a urgencia que le coloca a uno esteroides intravenosos. Lo otro es, si no responde esteroide intravenoso, o sea, ese 30, 35% de pacientes que no responde, ¿qué le damos? En esos pacientes tenemos opción, ciclosporina o tenemos infliximab. ¿Cuál es mejor? En los estudios aleatorizados, controlados, parece que da igual, sin embargo, en estudios observacionales hay cierta tendencia que le va mejor con infliximab que con ciclosporina, tanto respuesta a corto como a largo plazo. Este, por facilidad, por experiencia, no me tocó mucho la ciclosporina, ya cuando ya era gastroenterólogo empezó el infliximab y la experiencia pues, que tenemos eh, en general, en todo el consenso, eh, en todos lo, los participantes, fue que eh, preferimos usar infliximab. Este es el esquema que, que señalamos en el consenso, básicamente utilizar, iniciar con hidrocortisona, medimos respuesta al día 3-5, si el paciente no responde, nos inclinamos para, más por infliximab, si el paciente responde, pues prendizona y probablemente tengas que continuar con un medicamento, bien sea satioprina, antitnf, bedo, ustekinumab e incluso tofacitinib. ¿Qué dice nuestro consenso? Fuerte a favor, se recomienda el uso de infliximab para el manejo de pacientes con colitis ulcerativa aguda severa refractaria a la administración de corticoides intravenosos. Condicional en contra, que es una práctica que, que, que también he visto que, que se está como imponiendo un poco, es como hacer esquema intensificado, o sea, colocar una dosis, no esperar las dos semanas, sino a los tres, cuatro días, si no funciona, otra nueva dosis y después, eso se puede hacer, hay estudios que demuestran eso, pero se recomienda hacerlo en centros, pero no como, como rutinario, ¿ok? Por eso colocamos rutinario en, la, en, la, en, la, en el texto. Eh, ¿Se puede considerar el esquema intensificado como terapia aguda de rescate? sí. Se prefiere utilizar dosis inicial de infliximab de 5, no a todos de entrada colocarle 10. Hay algunos tipos de pacientes y lo colocamos en el texto a cuáles eh, preferimos. Pacientes eh, que tengan actividad endoscópica muy severa, eh, úlceras, pacientes que tengan PCR muy alta. Probablemente esos pacientes preferimos colocar dosis de entrada más altas. Eh, y dejamos la opción también de ciclosporina. ¿no? Algunos países, por ejemplo, eh, ejemplo, Bolivia, Bolivia no tiene terapia biológica, entonces pues, si tienen ciclosporina, pues tú no le puedes decir, no, pues, usa infliximab porque no tiene. Entonces, en esos pacientes, en esos países, pues dejamos la opción también de ciclosporina. Y por último, es el impacto del volumen quirúrgico en la mortalidad posoperatoria de colitis ulcerativa. Nos preocupó mucho esto, particularmente porque necesitamos centros eh, en Colombia, en Argentina, en Brasil, México, en fin, que demuestran result buenos resultados en el tratamiento quirúrgico de la colitis ulcerativa. Ya dijimos, alrededor de un 10% a los 10 años de estos pacientes van a colectomía. Entonces, miren cómo incrementa la morbilidad. O sea, si un paciente, si un centro hace más de 12 procedimientos de estos, bolsas ileales con resección colónica, eh, ese es el punto de referencia, pero si hace entre 4 y 11 bolsas ciliares, la mortalidad es dos veces más y la morbilidad incrementa. Y si tiene menos de tres de, de este tipo de cirugías, 
aumenta incluso más la, la, la mortalidad. Entonces, uno de los recomendaciones es que se recomienda la protocolectomía restauradora con, bio, con bolsa ileal y anastomosis ileonal para el manejo de pacientes con colitis ulcerativa refractaria al tratamiento médico. El manejo quirúrgico de los pacientes se debe realizar en instituciones de alto nivel de complejidad, con experiencia, con personal entrenado en el manejo de este tipo de pacientes y que por lo menos hagan 10 procedimientos de esto al año. O sea, es, un, es una meta. Yo sé que con el uso biológico ha disminuido un poco la, la, la parte de quirúrgica en colitis ulcerativa, pero queremos que estos pacientes cuando se operen, los opere gente pues, este, entrenada con buenos resultados en esto. Condicional en contra, no se sugiere la apendicectomía electiva, es otra, otro, algo curioso, pues hay estudios, hay revisiones, incluso en Jordan Crohn and Colitis y todo, sobre la apendicectomía profiláctica en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa, pero como parte del manejo eh, revisamos y, y condicional en contra, no, no se sugiere realizarla. Para finalizar entonces, estudios recientes demuestran que la colitis ulcerativa es el tipo de enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal más frecuente en Latinoamérica y viene incrementando. Para definir el tratamiento es necesario determinar actividad clínica y endoscópica, extensión y, ojo, estratificar el riesgo individual. Los objetivos terapéuticos en colitis ulcerativa han cambiado, es necesario tratar más allá de los síntomas, probablemente tenemos que hacer más colonoscopia, la rectosimodoscopia a veces es suficiente para determinar actividad en colitis ulcerativa, no siempre hay que hacer colonoscopia completa en colitis ulcerativa, ya conoce el paciente, ya conoce la extensión. Nuevas moléculas como budesonida, MMX, ustekinumab, tofa, entre otras, están disponibles para el tratamiento de colitis ulcerativa en Latinoamérica. Curiosamente, nosotros en Colombia todavía no tenemos ustekinumab, pero Ecuador, Perú, este, Argentina, Brasil, en fin, eh, Chile, todos tienen, México. Eh, y definitivamente es necesario tener en Latinoamérica centros especializados en el manejo quirúrgico de pacientes con colitis ulcerativa cuando esta está indicada. Mil gracias por su atención. Muchas gracias, doctor Juliado, por su excelente presentación y por liderar estos proyectos de guía de manejo a nivel de Latinoamérica. A continuación, nuevamente le damos la bienvenida a la doctora Joana Torres con Estado del Arte en el Tratamiento de la Enfermedad de Crohn 2022. Okay, so uh, hello again. I'm going to speak on state-of-the-art treatment of Crohn's disease, and I actually think this is a difficult topic, in my opinion. I've been involved in guidelines, and I must admit that guidelines fail to address many of the questions we face in our clinical practice. They are very strict according to the results from the randomized trials, and sometimes I think it's kind of difficult. So this is going to be a mix be between evidence and also uh, between my, my own clinical practice and my own, uh, my, my own uh, um, feeling on, on the state-of-the-art treatment of Crohn's disease in 2022. So the problem is that we know that Crohn's disease has a very variable course, and of course, we know it's very difficult to predict in individual patients, even when we are applying all these features we discussed yesterday. And besides that, Crohn's disease is a transmural disease. So over time, if left untreated or if uh, there is smoldering inflammation, regardless of symptoms, it will lead to complications, stenosing and stricturing complications. And this will result in surgeries. And still today, there is a rate of around 20% of surgery by year five after diagnosis. And so this has led to an evolution on the long-term and short-term goals of Crohn's disease. We discussed this yesterday. Today, in 2022, we should treat behind symptoms. It's very important to uh, resolve the symptoms, to strive for clinical remission in our patients, but we really, really should base our decisions and sh we should keep on monitoring our patients to make sure that there is biomarker normalization and endoscopic healing. So we kind of touched some of these aspects yesterday, and I think for me, uh, these are the fundamental principles of treating Crohn's disease 
in 2022, so patient stratification, early intervention, personalized therapy selection, applying a tight monitoring and a treat to target, and also selecting the best time for surgery and preventing postoperative recurrence. So, like we discussed already yesterday, it's different disease activity from disease severity. When we are seeing a patient, he has symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal pain, etc. But we need to incorporate some clinical features into our decision to also understand what's going to be the disease severity, the disease course in that single patient. So this is actually, I think, generally speaking, what I'm using in my practice. So patients with young age that diagnosis, they have a full life to live with disease. Patients with extensive anatomic involvement, perianal disease, presence of deep ulcers, complications at diagnosis or during follow-up, history of surgery. Generally speaking, these are the principles I apply in my practice to select those patients that apply for early intervention. And we discussed that there seems to be a window of opportunity, so selecting those patients and giving them the most effective therapy during this early stage offers them the greatest chance to obtain benefits. So I showed these results yesterday already, two studies looking at early introduction of immunomodulators and really showing that maybe there is not um, a huge advantage or that they may not offer uh, in all patients the possibility to change disease course. And these are the ECHO guidelines that I have been involved some years ago. And based on these studies, we recommended against the early introduction of azathioprine or thiopirins and really with the aim of disease modification. And so this is data from United States where there were three groups uh, of patients. So essentially those that received the early anti-TNF here in black, those that received immunomodulator and were transitioned to anti-TNF, so I guess this is what we call the accelerated step-up strategy, and then those that received 5-ASA and steroids prior to anti-TNF here. In, uh, in, in, in this, uh, here, in, black, in, in white, I'm sorry. And so as you can see in black, those that received the early anti-TNF had much, uh, so less chances of receiving steroids or of needing surgery. So again, implying that this story of early intervention has a lot of evidence to support indeed that this may be the best strategy for our patients with Crohn's disease, at least for some. So of course then it comes to selecting the best therapy for each patient. And we know that in many countries, especially in Europe, we, it's, 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 although it's a difficult equation or a difficult decision, often we are really kind of uh, need to follow reimbursement rules. And so there is not much we can do. But still, you know, besides patient stratification into mild and uh, severe disease, it, there's a lot of things we need to take into consideration uh, related to drug, but also related to patient-related factors. So we need to consider, of course, the cost, but also the indication, the speed of onset, the safety of that drug. And we should consider um, the wish for pregnancy in our female patients, uh, safety, patient comorbidities, also convenience, mode of administration, etc. And of course, that ideally, we would have a biomarker that would tell us this patient has an X percentage risk of progression. This patient is more likely to uh, benefit from this or that drug. But in the absence of a precision medicine biomarker for therapy selection, it really comes, I think, into our clinical intuition to select the best therapy for each patient. So I, I wanted to have a word on the management of mild disease because according to population-based studies, 20 to 30% of Crohn's disease in the general practice outside tertiary centers will have a mild disease course and won't benefit to be exposed to immunosuppressive therapy and to the toxicity of this therapy. So the ECHO guidelines have recommended against the introduction of 5-ASA for induction and for maintenance. And I think this was a very strong message uh, because indeed they haven't shown to be better than placebo. And according to the ECHO guidelines, we recommended budesonide for the induction of mild iliocolonic disease. But you can see here a summary of the different guidelines in managing um, mild Crohn's disease. And actually, this is a topic, I think this is an unmet need for research where we really don't know exactly how to treat these patients. The ECHO guidelines even recommend or suggest that maybe for some patients we can uh, just monitor them and not offer therapy. So what about thiopirins? So I think um, Amelie maybe can comment on that, but I think thiopirins 
from what I hear, have kind of been abandoned in the United States. I'm not sure if it's true, but they are still used a lot in Europe, especially in UK and other countries. And this, I think, is probably the largest, it's a retrospective study to almost 12,000 patients that were treated during their disease course with thiopurine monotherapy. And uh, they looked into Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and they, they saw that thiopurine monotherapy was effective only in one-third of patients with Crohn's disease, and the factors affecting the success of thiopurines in Crohn's disease was having a colonic disease. And so, uh, in my clinical practice, I think this is a situation, those patients with colonic disease that I induced them with steroids, and I maintain them with a thiopurine, uh, with a thiopurine. I think this is still the situation where I'm using a thiopurine with uh, good efficacy, and the ECHO guidelines recommend thiopurines only for maintaining remission in patients with steroid-dependent Crohn's disease, aside, of course, that of their use uh, in combination therapy. So I think this talk is really about patients with moderate to severe disease, so which drug should we choose? We already discussed the factors that may affect our decision. The ECHO guidelines do not recommend any biologic over the other. Uh, we, we, we don't have much head-to-head -head trials. I'll discuss that in a, while, in a moment. And I think the puzzle is really becoming complex because until 2014, we had anti-TNF and we were kind of cycling through anti-TNF. We were trying to optimize the maximum of our, of our anti-TNF. Then we got Vido then you take Kinumab, and I think very soon we will have Rizankizumab, Gazelkumab, Upadacitinib, Filgotinib, and also, I think, uh, maybe S1P modulators. So it's really kind of, I think, becoming complex on which is the best drug to use in our patients. I wanted to share these results that were recently published on Rizankizumab. This is an anti-IL-23. And um, this is the induction results of the Motivate and Advance. So um, Advance was biologic experience, biologic naive patients, while Motivate was just biologic experience patients. And you can see that both dosages of Rizankizumab were significantly superior to placebo for CDAI remission, PRO remission, and also for endoscopic response already by week 12. These are the maintenance phase results showing that, again, endoscopic response was significantly better also in those patients receiving the active treatment and stratified by prior uh, biofailure, and showing that even in this refractory population, the results, the, the drug works as well. And something, I think, a major, major advantage of Ruizan Kizumab is that it has an excellent, excellent safety profile. I have a couple of patients that were recruited into the clinical trials, and, uh, and it really worked very well for them. It's, keeps working. So these were presented at TDW, the upadacitinib data. So this is an oral drug. It's a JAK inhibitor. It has been approved in Europe and USA for the treatment of ulcerative colitis. And I, I guess uh, based on the preliminary data, and we'll see the maintenance data at UEG, it will also be approved for Crohn's disease. So here I'm showing you those patients that had prior biofailure. And this is where drugs um, often have a lot of difficulty to meet their primary and some secondary endpoints because this is a very refractory population. So 61% of patients had failed to biologics, one third were on steroids at baseline, so a very refractory population. And I think the data is quite impressive. So you can see here the, um, the, re the results of clinical remission by week 12. But look at endoscopic response and endoscopic remission, which is a much more objective marker of a drug working, at least for me, in Crohn's disease. I think the difference to placebo, it's quite impressive. So uh, we will see the maintenance data, and uh, I think this will come to our practices soon. So Guzelcomab is another anti-IL-23. This is the phase two data uh, where several drugs were tested against placebo. There was a reference arm with this tekinumab here in purple, and the phase three is ongoing. But based on the preliminary results, we'll wait to see what looks 73 percent of clinical remission with, with guzelcomab. So again, anti-IL-23, I think it will offer the benefit of efficacy with a major, major benefit for safety. So how can then we choose the best drug for our patients, right? And there are several tools, I would say statistical tools, 
to help us to position and to sequence our drugs. We have head-to-head -head trials. We often need to resort to network meta-analysis. And having worked in the guideline committee, I will, tell, I will tell you that there is a lot of limitations to a network meta-analysis because in the end we are comparing different populations, even if it's considered a very good statistical method. And then we, of course, have real-world data. And so head-to-head -head is really the best that we have to compare drugs. We only have, besides Sonic, one head-to-head, -head, Ustekinumab versus Adalimumab. This has been published recently, essentially showing that there were no differences in patients biologic naive, uh, Crohn's disease biologic naive, starting Ustekinumab or Adalimumab for clinical remission and also for endoscopic uh, remission. And I think what's interesting about this uh, data is that we were kind of always thinking as clinicians that anti-TNF is the best because it's what we used first for many years. And I think this piece of data showed us that perhaps, you know, it's, it, other biologics can work as well. So our first choice of biologic is very important. And these are the results of a, a network meta-analysis that has been recently published showing infliximab ranking the first for clinical remission, rizankizumab ranking the first in biologic naive and biologic exposed, and NUPA ranking the first for maintenance of remission. So I, I'm really not sure how to, what to make out of these results because I'm not sure how helpful this is uh, when we try to apply it to, in our clinical practice, but I think it's kind of an indication of efficacy. But there are other aspects that we need to consider, safety, durability, and of course second line, although we don't have head-to-head -head trials for second line options. And we need to recognize here that anti-TNF work very well, but they are not the safest drugs. And I've encountered many more uh, complications and serious infections with anti-TNF than I have encountered with thy appearance, for example. And indeed, this meta-analysis has shown that ustekinumab is much safer uh, associated with a lower risk of serious infections as compared to anti-TNF, but also as compared to vitalizumab. And this is, I think, very nice. Many studies have shown this and something to consider. Once you develop an antibody to a first anti-TNF, the risk of developing antibody to the subsequent anti-TNF is much greater as compared if you are switching out of class. So this is potentially something to consider in patients who have a higher risk for developing immunogenicity. So I'm going to go fast through this tight monitoring and treat to target. I think we have discussed this extensively yesterday. Essentially, we need to adopt a therapeutic target. And endoscopic healing so far seems to be the best therapeutic target we have in our practices. This is data from France showing that the, the greatest degree of endoscopic healing you achieve, the best your patient will do over the long term. And you see here they are comparing actually endoscopic full remission, full healing of the mucosa as compared to some um, persistence of some inflammation, which I think would be acceptable in many patients, but still showing that there is a difference over the long term. And I've showed the results of the CALM study yesterday, so we, we need to wait uh, to perform our endoscopies by six months, nine months, 12 months. It depends on, on the setting and on the availability. And so we can monitor our patients proactively using biomarkers because we know by doing so and by adapting our therapies in doing so, we will have greater chances to achieve clinical remission, but also endoscopic healing. So finally, I wanted to have a word for surgery because we often neglect surgery. And I think that for some patients, surgery is still the best option. And it's very difficult to select the best patient for surgery, but we need to recognize that at least, at least for those patients with a, a stricturing complications, with significant dilation of the bowel above the, the stenosis, and sometimes also with fistulizing complications, it's the best option. And sometimes we can kind of reset the disease and you can, we can kind of start over. It's a new start for that patient. But I wanted to touch upon this study, which is the Lyric study, and this was done in the Netherlands, so very strong surgical team there. And I think this is quite provocative. They randomized patients with inflammatory phenotypes. So this was not patients with complications where surgery, I think, would be more straightforward. They randomized patients to surgery or to infliximab. And the end point was the quality of life of the patient after one year of therapy. And so you can see here in blue, this was the ileal resection that indeed there were no differences at the end of the first year in quality of life, different quality of life domains between um, infliximab and surgery. And this is also uh, other domains of the quality of life of these patients.
But what I think it's most interesting actually is the long-term data and this was already kind of done outside randomized control settings or there may be some, I don't know, some biases here. But still look, those patients that got surgery as a first choice, 22% of those patients did not need to start an IBD treatment. 20% of those patients that started immunomodulator after surgery were kept on the immunomodulator. 26% and 32% started anti-TNF or other treatments. While those patients that were started on infliximab, um, so 38% continued infliximab, but almost 50% ended up needing surgery. So I think the kind of the difficulty we face today is that we don't have good um, selecting rules for surgery. I think this is something that we need to improve, how to really understand where, when our therapies have really kind of provided the best benefit for our patients and when the balance of kind of going for surgery is the best choice for our patients. And finally, if indeed we go to surgery, it's very important to keep monitoring our patients, to keep stratifying our patients. I think it's always this, this same loop on risk stratification, treat to target, and type monitoring. So not all patients are at the same risk for clinical recurrence and endoscopic recurrence after surgery. There are some rules to risk stratify and to decide whether or not to start prophylactic therapy. And DTNF has shown to be the best therapy after surgery in network meta-analysis and meta-analysis, and I'm sorry, and this is actually some data, uh, some uh, collaborative work we have done uh, in Europe led by Anit and I from Israel, uh, many centers uh, collaborating with their patients that were started after surgery with anti-TNF, but also vitalizumab, estekinumab, and essentially, uh, and of course this is retrospective, there are many biases here, but essentially it shows that other biologics can also do uh, the work for prophylactic uh, recurrence, so for preventing postoperative recurrence. And so finally, this is the data from the POKER study from uh, Australia, this was published already a while ago, and essentially what they did in this study was they followed patients after surgery and they treated them standard of care, so if the flare, they would start on treatment, etc. Where uh, for the active care group, they perform an endoscopy at six months post-surgery, and based on the endoscopy, they, they had rules on whether to start therapy or to optimize therapy. And so, and then at 18 months, the primary endpoint was the root curve score, so endoscopic recurrence. And so, essentially, what they showed was that by monitoring your patients, by adjusting your therapy based on the endoscopic findings, you will have um, a lesser chance of having a, a recurrence. So again, tight monitoring, three to targets. And so to conclude, uh, Crohn's disease is a lifelong disease, so we, this is, I think, something very important to consider when we are selecting our therapies, when we are kind of making the balance between efficacy, safety, disease severity. I do believe that early intervention, treat to target, and tight monitoring offer the chances to deliver the best care to patients, even if there, I think, I think there are still some controversies in these topics, and it's still difficult sometimes to apply them in our practices. Biomarkers to guide therapy selection are urgently needed, in my opinion, because it will become really, really difficult to, how to use the best drug. And actually, the, the answer is already lying in the freezers or, I don't know, of the pharmaceutical companies across the world. So they have the answer already. That I think they need to work with the academia to really deliver that answer. And so in the absence of these biomarkers, I think the best medical care remains a balanced decision involving the patient and the best evidence available. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Joana Torres, por su excelente conferencia. Eh, a continuación, tenemos a la doctora Milly Long, profesora de medicina y directora del área del programa de Fellowship de Gastroenterología y Hepatología. Es la vicedirectora también de Educación de la Universidad de Carolina del Norte en Chapel Hill y trabaja actualmente en la División de Gastroenterología y Hepatología eh, de esta universidad. Bienvenida. Doctora Milly Long, quien nos va a hablar sobre prevención de complicaciones en enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. Y felicitaciones por su medalla en la carrera, por haber ganado la carrera. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful country. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, 
I'll be speaking this morning on prevention of complications of inflammatory bowel disease. And Joanna set the stage very nicely in regards to prevention of IBD itself. But I also think we need to be thinking about preventing complications of our therapies and what those can do to our patients. These are my disclosures. And as an outline, we'll focus on infections currently, um, a number of these uh, that could potentially be preventable. In a subsequent lecture, I'll speak about malignancy and kind of end with a, a summary of uh, prevention in IBD. As Joanna mentioned, there are three forms of prevention. Primary prevention, which is preventing a disease from developing, uh, such as immunizations. Secondary, which is we as gastroenterologists do this every day in colonoscopy, uh, screening programs that prevent complications of disease. And tertiary prevention, which is what Joanna was mentioning, that we do actively in managing our IBD patients, where we need to treat the underlying inflammation to prevent the downstream consequences uh, and minimize the disability. So I'll do a few cases as we talk about uh, prevention. The first is a, a young uh, woman whom I saw uh, with UC, and she was in clinical remission on infliximab, and she presented with this rash on her back. Um, she's due for infliximab th this week, and no systemic signs. I think we all recognize that this is an opportunistic infection, and that patients with inflammatory bowel disease are at risk for both opportunistic and serious infections. Those risks are due to a number of factors. Uh, there are external factors, namely the immunosuppression therapy that we use, exposure to pathogens, and of course, geographic distributions where uh, more endemic um, exposures. Older age, more comorbidities, as well as malnutrition uh, play a role. So herpes zoster is actually known to be um, a risk in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This was a study we did a little while ago that showed an instance rate ratio of nearly two in Crohn's disease as compared to the general population. But importantly, this risk persists across ages. Uh, as you can see here, whether pediatric or adult, we see an increased risk of herpes zoster in Crohn's and UC patients. And in fact, in the US, the vaccination strategies for herpes zoster used to be at age 50. And when you look at the mark of age 50, our patients with inflammatory bowel disease have this increased risk even at earlier ages. So we did a nested case control study to try to determine what are the specific medications associated with this increased risk. And as you can see, whether steroids, thiopurines, or TNFs, you do have an odds ratio of approximately two for development of zoster. The class that seems to be most specific for an elevated risk is actually the JAK inhibitors. I know that you all have tofacitinib here. We just had upadacitinib approved in the US as well. With tofacitinib, about 5.5% of patients in the trials developed zoster with an instance rate of four. And as you can see, this does seem to be a dose-dependent risk. And in my practice, frankly, I'm using this drug in patients who have previously been exposed to a TNF, and I'm using the higher dose, the 10 milligrams twice daily, and maintaining patients on that. And as you can see, with the higher dose, you do have a higher risk. Interestingly, with uh, upadacitinib, which is a recently approved both in Europe and in the US, selective JAK1 inhibitor, the hope was with upadacitinib that perhaps we'd see less uh, side effects, less safety concerns. Um, but interestingly, and unfortunately, at least for herpes zoster, you'll see that there is still an increased risk uh, in a dose-dependent format, uh, particularly in the light blue, the upadacitinib 30 milligram dose, which is the maintenance dose we use uh, in the United States, has uh, an, an exposure-adjusted instance rate in the neighborhood of five to six. And as you can see here, again, the blue line being the higher dose for maintenance, uh, we do seem to have a persistent increased risk with upadacitinib. So the selectivity does not take away uh, all of the side effect profile. Influenza risk is also increased in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and particularly with corticosteroids. In my practice, I try to minimize duration of corticosteroids if possible, or potentially try to use a biologic with a rapider onset of action to try to avoid uh, corticosteroids, which isn't always possible.
And in fact, influenza complications are also higher, increased hospitalization, uh, post-influenza pneumonia in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We did this study that looked at the annual incidence per 10,000, so a much more common uh, complication as compared to zoster, which I just showed you. And in fact, uh, the adjusted hazards ratio is about 1.5 for development of pneumonia. When you look at the specific risk factors for pneumonia, yes, there's a slight increased risk with anti-TNF medications um, and with uh, proton pump inhibitors, which we know related to acid suppression. Uh, but corticosteroids, yet again, seem to drive this risk. We also did some work looking at meningitis risk. On, and while the absolute risk is quite low, this is the incidence per 100,000 person years, you can see that this risk does persist across categories of age with an increased risk for IBD patients, and that comorbidities and steroids really seem to increase this risk. And again, many of these complications are potentially preventable through appropriate uh, prevention and immunization. So let me show you another case. Um, this is a 44-year-old woman uh, whom I see for colonic Crohn's disease, and she has perianal pyoderma. Um, I, we do see a lot of extraintestinal manifestations with Crohn's, particularly in patients with colonic inflammation. And she actually had a diverting colostomy and had been on a number of various immunosuppressive agents. And currently, she's on combination therapy with a TNF and azathioprine. And one of the things we do for pyoderma is we actually inject corticosteroids into the pyoderma ulcerations, and we were doing intralesional injections, and she presented with shortness of breath. And this was her chest x-ray. So quite clearly, she had pneumocystis uh, giovecci. And in fact, this was related uh, most likely to the immunosuppression she was on and absorption from the steroid injections that I was giving her for her pyoderma. And obviously, uh, pneumocystis uh, giovecci is associated with high rates of morbidity and mortality. And at, at the point of this case, there had really only been case reports in the literature and no ability to really quantify this risk. So we did a, a study in administrative claims in the United States to really enhance our power. And as you can see, patients with inflammatory bowel disease do have an increased risk of pneumocystis giovecci. And when we looked specifically at the medications, this graph is just meant to show you the colors, you'll see there's a lot of yellow, and that yellow is all corticosteroids. Um, the hash marks are hospitalizations, so this really was seen in patients who had been getting high-dose uh, steroids, as well as com uh, those with comorbidities. And interestingly, even now, this was a paper just from earlier this year, the incidence of pneumocystis giovecci is actually increasing in IBD patients in the U.S., in spite of the fact that it's reducing in the overall population. Thankfully, it's still exceedingly rare, but yet again, uh, chronic steroids, uh, immunodeficiency are the risk factors. So prophylaxis is possible, and this is something we do uh, in the U.S., and actually ECHO guidelines have also recommended this, particularly in patients on triple immunosuppression, meaning steroids, a thiopurine, and a TNF. Or in my practice, I also do this in individuals on a calcineurin inhibitor, uh, cyclosporin, and uh, steroids. Uh, we actually do use a good bit of cyclosporin in the U.S., particularly for induction of remission of uh, very severe ulcerative sort of colitis, when the albumin is low, it's very difficult to get uh, an anti-TNF to an appropriate level. So we'll use a cyclosporin to induce and then vetalizumab to maintain. So uh, a third case, and I think this is probably everyone in this room has had these patients over the last two years, but a young patient on adalimumab who develops uh, COVID infection. Um, she had been previously vaccinated um, and she has questions about her risks. So this was the secure, IB, the secure um, COVID registry that we, we out of UNC initiated early in the pandemic. And we really found that patients with inflammatory bowel disease as compared uh, to the general population have similar risks, age, comorbidities, but that really biologic use did not increase uh, risks of severe COVID, did not increase the risks of an ICU, ventilator, or death. And when you look at the specific risk, it does seem to be slightly higher with individuals on combination therapy, a thiopurine and an anti-TNF, but yet overall outcomes have been reassuring.
So I wanted to spend just a moment talking about primary prevention guidance for patients with inflammatory bowel disease and some newer data surrounding um, vaccinations. And in particular, uh, this is the ACG guideline from 2017 that recommended a number of preventive activities. And since this time, you know, we've really emphasized a few changes. The first is herpes zoster vaccination in the U.S. is now recommended in all individuals aged 18 and over uh, to help to prevent complications. This is something that we do routinely in our practice now. And of course, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. We'll also talk a little bit about streptococcal pneumonia vaccine in that this can help prevent not only pneumonia, but also meningitis. And I think importantly, has been shown to be effective in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. As you can see uh, in this graph, individuals with inflammatory bowel disease who were vaccinated uh, with pneumococcal vaccine had a markedly reduced risk of serious uh, pneumococcal disease. And the newest vaccination recommendations in the U.S. do include the new novel uh, Prevnar 20 um, vaccine as a one-time dose. And when we think about shingles vaccination, this vaccine has been studied in IBD populations. There's no increased risk of flare. It has similar local um, side effects to those who do not have inflammatory bowel disease, um, but importantly, has equal efficacy. And so I also wanted to emphasize some work we've done looking at COVID-19 vaccination in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This is the PREVENT COVID study, uh, which we initiated early in the pandemic. It's a large direct-to-patient uh, registry with over 3,500 patients with inflammatory bowel disease who are recruited to join. They actually complete periodic surveys um, after vaccination um, to, to understand whether there are any uh, flares of disease uh, or whether individuals have significant side effects. But additionally, we have blood draws uh, at three to four time points in the first uh, 18 months to help us determine the quantitative titer against uh, COVID-19. And so these are the participants. And again, we have uh, a number of participants, varying ages, including pediatric participants. And importantly, most of these patients were on immunosuppressive medications. So infliximab, uh, adalimumab, uh, vetalizumab, uh, ustekinumab, which we do have available in the U.S. So we were able to look specifically at uh, quantitative titers and how our patients responded. And individuals uh, received predominantly the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines in the U.S. These are the mRNA vaccines. And what we found was that, in fact, our biologic medications do not reduce titers. The only reduction of titer was seen in combination therapy with anti-TNF uh, and thiopurine, um, as well as with corticosteroids. But importantly, even those individuals mounted a, an appropriate response. The factors associated with lack of antibody development include uh, time, um, older age. And so these are a uh, demonstration of the antibody durability over time, uh, which was appropriate for both Moderna uh, and Pfizer vaccines. We also looked at subsequent booster doses and were able to demonstrate that initially about 95% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease mounted a titer. But then after an initial booster dose, it ended up at 99.5%. Um, so in other words, these booster doses really did provide full coverage for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So when we summarize things with immunization, uh, I do, we always recommend that we catch up individuals on vaccines as appropriate, but really highlight the need for pneumococcal vaccination, certainly zoster vaccination, which we now, um, thanks to work demonstrating the risk in younger patients, we actually give to everyone age 18 and up. And I do think this will be very important because we are going to be using these JAK inhibitors in practice. And, Upadacitinib, while uh, we've seen some of the wonderful efficacy data from Joanna, we still need to think about the safety as well, and that COVID-19 vaccination is also recommended. So let me circle back to the cases that we discussed. Uh, my first case uh, obviously had herpes zoster. We did dose her infliximab as soon as the lesions crusted over, treated her with valacyclovir. This was uncomplicated. And just remember that patients with inflammatory bowel disease on immunosuppression should be treated regardless of the time frame where they present, um, not just in the first 72-hour uh, window. My second case with pneumocystis uh, did get treated with uh, Bactrim um, and corticosteroids, and she improved quickly. 
And I think that this case pointed out to me is that we really do need to consider prophylaxis in patients on multiple levels of immunosuppression and that steroid injections can also mount a systemic steroid response that we need to consider. For my young lady with COVID, uh, we recommended supportive care. She did not have other risk factors for severe COVID. Uh, if she had had comorbidities, our treatment of choice in the US is Paxlovid. Uh, we monitored her carefully, and as soon as she was fever-free, she continued on her adalimumab. So again, thinking about prevention, not only, as Joanna mentioned, is this a wonderful place to understand the potential prevention of even the onset of inflammatory bowel disease, but once an individual develops inflammatory bowel disease at diagnosis is when we should be thinking about the, preventing these downstream complications addressing their disease appropriately, controlling their inflammatory burden to prevent long-term disease and disability, and do appropriate secondary prevention screening steps, whether that be colonoscopy, skin exams, pap smears, to prevent uh, downstream complications there. And with that, I'll conclude, and thank you so much. Muchas gracias, doctora Mirón, por su excelente presentación, por compartir sus casos y toda su investigación en un tema de la vida diaria como es la prevención y sobre todo de las, del riesgo que tienen estos pacientes de enfermedad inflamatoria. Entonces, a continuación, los invitamos a hacerle sus preguntas. Mientras tanto, para empezar, eh, voy a preguntarle a la doctora Joana Torres, eh, de todos los marcadores... Eh, todos los marcadores genéticos, los biomarcadores que están publicados en la literatura y que no contamos con ellos, por ejemplo, en la práctica usual para medir el riesgo de progresión de la enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. Si pudiéramos tenerlos, eh, ¿cuál de todos le, le parece más eh, que tiene mejor rendimiento y cuáles recomendaría eh, para predecir precisamente esa evolución del riesgo en estos pacientes? Gracias. Es, uh, voy a responder en español. Es, <risa> es una excelente pregunta. La verdad es que, uh, aunque haya muchos genes que están asociados a la susceptibilidad de enfermedad de Crohn y colitis ulcerosa, uh, su capacidad predictiva, es, el riesgo que conferen es muy, muy bajo, bajo para que puedan ser utilizados para prever alguien que va a des desarrollar enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. Entonces, lo que se hace es se intenta combinar el riesgo conferido por cada uno de esos genes en uh, lo que se llama los polygenic risk scores, ri um, scores con todos los genes, pero aún así la genética sola uh, no ha uh, probado ser capaz de prever, eh, predecir quién va a desarrollar enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. Entonces, que es una pieza del puzzle, pero se tiene que combinar con otros marcadores y aún no hemos sido capaces de hacer la, de, de, de desarrollar un score que, que combine de forma perfecta eso todo. Entonces, que y además no, no ha también um, sido capaz, ha habido un estudio muy grande con uh, genética intentando prever las complicaciones, por ejemplo, de desarrollar complicaciones estenosantes, penetrantes, y tampoco ha sido capaz de, de ser capaz de predecir ese tipo de complicaciones. Entonces creo que es un indicador de susceptibilidad, pero tiene que haber algo más en términos de biomarcadores. Muchas gracias, doctora. Yo quería aprovechar en ese mismo sentido, de pronto, doctora Joana, a veces tenemos, por ejemplo, eh, pacientes con Crohn, colitis ulcerativa, que tienen hijos. Entonces le preguntan a uno, bueno, ¿qué hago yo o qué le puedo recomendar a mi hijo como medidas prácticas, dieta, en fin, para que no le dé colitis ulcerativa? Sabemos que la genética no explica todo, pero entonces, ¿cómo ¿qué está demostrado que pueda servir para prevenir colitis ulcerativa o Crohn en, en la descendencia de un paciente en, en este caso? ¿no? Esa es una pregunta muy interesante. Es algo que los, eh, las madres, los padres que sufren de enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal quieren saber. Entonces, lo mejor que podemos decir es que no fumen, eh, que, eh, que haya cuidado con la exposición a antibióticos, eh, que tengan un estilo de vida, una dieta saludable y aunque no hay una evidencia muy fuerte de hacer estas recomendaciones, creo que no hay mal 
de hacernos recomendaciones que promuevan el estilo de vida saludable. Entonces, que hemos publicado hace dos semanas un estudio en que hemos mirado a familias en que el padre o la madre tenía enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal, y tenían pelo menos dos hijos, uno ha desarrollado enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal, el otro no. Entonces, que el riesgo genético es el mismo, el riesgo ambiental, la dieta, etc., es el mismo. Entonces, ¿cuál es la diferencia? Entonces, esto ha sido utilizando la base de datos de Dinamarca. Entonces, hemos mirado a, a enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal, a otras a, a enfermedades inmunomediadas, exposición a fármacos, historia de cirugía, etc., y el factor más, más importante ha sido la exposición a antibióticos. Entonces, que claro que es importante por veces los antibióticos, pero sabemos también que hay mucha exposición desnecesaria a antibióticos. Entonces, que es, creo que esa es una recomendación útil. Doctor Diego Aponte. Eh, doctora Torres, eh, muchas gracias. Muchos trabajos muy interesantes publicados y unos ya en camino de publicación, ahí vimos. La pregunta es sobre el estudio LIRIC que usted mostró, que hiciera un concepto. Es un estudio donde los pacientes que ingresaron no tenían ni siquiera estenosis, sino inflamación. Y además el desenlace es solamente calidad de vida. Eh, ¿Qué opina usted de entrar a algunos de estos pacientes a esas cirugías, comparándolo con infliximab? Y entonces la segunda pregunta sería, ¿y si estuvieran estenóticos, tendrían todavía más indicación de ser llevados muchos de estos pacientes a cirugías? ¿Cuáles son sus conceptos? Entonces, que yo aún no estoy preparada para empezar uh, uh, aplicando los resultados de estudio líric en, mi, en mis pacientes con un fenotipo inflamatorio. Lo mismo no es decir que los pacientes con estenosis o con complicaciones penetrantes es un grupo distinto que tienen una indicación más fuerte para cirugía. Uh, pero el estudio lírico ha reclutado pacientes con una enfermedad corta, 40 centímetros. Para mí eso no es una enfermedad con corta extensión. Entonces, pero aún así creo que es importante porque indica que hay un grupo de pacientes que benefician a largo plazo de cirugía porque no han recidivado, pero aún no somos capaces de seleccionar bien esos pacientes. Me gustaría saber el, la opinión de Milly en esto. No, I agree, but I think there are some patients who are risk averse and don't want to start a biologic, and I think the data are clear that it can be efficacious, particularly in the first three to five years. And so I think we do need to consider who is the right patient for early surgery. I agree with Joanna that that tends to me to be the strictured patient, um, you know, the patient who has a short segment stricturing disease, that, that is an ideal surgical candidate. The inflammatory phenotype, my preference would be to try medical options first. Eh, doctora Milly Long, tengo una pregunta para usted eh, con respecto a los riesgos y complicaciones en los pacientes con enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal. ¿Qué nos puede decir del riesgo de cáncer de cervix en estas mujeres y eh, ustedes cómo hacen la vacunación para BPH en las mujeres con enfermedad inflamatoria intestinal? Yes, so the data are not incredibly clear um, in, in regards to specific drugs, but immunosuppression does seem to increase the risk at least of abnormal pap smear or low-grade dysplasia. And in that scenario, um, we obviously need to try to prevent and, and vaccinate appropriately. So we do use HPV vaccination um, in the U.S. as well to help to prevent that. But that is an important screening tool uh, that we need to utilize uh, for young women and, and men um, who are in risk categories. So again, the risks of malignancy, uh, we'll speak a little bit about this later, but predominantly with TNFs, it's skin cancer and lymphoma. And so we really do need to have conversations with patients about those risks and trying to potentially mitigate uh, the skin cancer risk in particular. Doctora Mililo, una pregunta. ¿Usted recomienda a todo paciente una vez diagnosticado con Crohn o colitis ulcerativa vacunarlos contra todas estos esta, estas enfermedades prevenibles, infecciones prevenibles o solamente antes de usar inmunosupresores o biológicos? So, for HPV, all, all individuals. Uh, for some of the other vaccinations, it really has to do with risk. And so, 
uh, herpes zoster vaccination, um, pneumococcal uh, vaccination, uh, meningococcal vaccination. Those I do um, at the start of planning to initiate immunosuppression because that's truly their risk factor at that young age. And, and again, you don't have to wait. So starting a JAK inhibitor, you don't have to wait until they've completed herpes zoster vaccination before starting the JAK inhibitor. You can give them both at the same time. It's the, the duration, the, the risk increases over the duration. And so please don't withhold treatment to vaccinate, but initiate at the same time. Dr. Barreiro. Uh, I, I would like to ask to Dr. Long, a question because what was her opinion about the use of combo therapy or monotherapy in preventing complication because I am a great defender of if I want to prevent com any complication I have to treat in monotherapy so I would like to know your opinion. So um, actually Joanna asked this too I use a lot of combination therapy in my practice I use TNF combined uh, with a thiopurine because it's very clear that immunogenicity exists and that the patient's disease potentially will be better controlled, particularly in the first year. But I try to mitigate those risks. Um, and over time, my goal, if I can, would be to start combination therapy, get the patient into endoscopic, potentially histologic, but endoscopic <laughs> clinical remission, and then pull off the thiopurine. The, the risks uh, for thiopurine really aren't that great in the first year uh, of use. And so that has really been my practice. Now, the novel bi biologics, which um, you all don't yet have ustekinumab um, or rizinkizumab, but the novel biologics really don't have the immunogenicity and uh, they really don't have as many of these safety signals. And so for those biologics, I do use monotherapy. But I, I do feel, um, maybe in contrast to some of my U.S. colleagues, that there's truly a role still for an anti-TNF and a thiopurine, uh, given the uh, improved efficacy and the reduction in immunogenicity in the first year. Doctora Joana Torres, ¿qué experiencia tiene usted con la combinación de dos biológicos, o do, un anti-TNF con anti-integrina o un anti-TNF con una pequeña molécula en los pacientes con enfermedad inflamatoria? Esto, eh, tenemos poca experiencia porque es muy difícil conseguir que sea aprobado en Portugal. Entonces, que tenemos como muchos pasos para conseguir su aprobación, pero eh, hay datos para sugerir y creo que me mecanísticamente hace sentido que en algunos enfermos, eh, combinando diferentes, atacando diferentes mecanismos, va a mejorar la eficacia. Um, lo, los estudios han publicado que no parece haber grandes preocupaciones de seguridad, pero ahí tengo un poquito más de dudas porque a largo, a largo plazo creo que me hace sentido también que sea una estrategia que puede traer más problemas en términos de seguridad. Vamos a tener los resultados, creo, temprano de Vega, ahora se llama Duet UC en CD, donde van a combinar anti TNF con una anti-IL-23, y eso creo que es una combinación muy interesante porque va a aumentar la eficacia y puede ser que no va a aumentar tanto, no va a penalizar tanto la seguridad. Y, uh, Buenas. I was going to say the recent results for induction from the VEGA trial, which is Guzelcumab, an IL-23, and uh, Golimumab, an anti-TNF, were really excellent for induction, you know, 80% uh, efficacy at eight weeks. And then the thought is, is you use dual biologics for induction and then we'll see how they do on single biologic for maintenance. In my practice, when I've used dual biologics, it's been because of an extra intestinal manifestation. So for example, perhaps a bowel disease is controlled on vetalizumab, um, but they have refractory extra intestinal manifestations. Um, or, um, you know, the, the fact that they may have refractory psoriasis on an anti-TNF, but that's the only thing that controls their bowel disease. And in that situation, I'll add an IL-1223. I think the important thing to remember is the safety. I would not combine a JAK and a TNF uh, because of safety. But our safer biologics, the IL-1223, IL-23s, um, may have a role combined with TNF, and certainly vetalizumab is exceedingly safe, and that may have a role uh, com in combination as well. Buenas. Eh, quiero hacer una pregunta. Buenas. Eh, 
Yo siempre he estado inquieta en los pacientes con colitis ulcerativa, que tienen muchos pseudopólipos, en especial algunos de colitis izquierda y que están comprometidos en la parte rectal, que sin displasia, ustedes indicarían una cirugía, una colectomía, mejorando totalmente la enfermedad, sin estar actividad de enfermedad, solo por riesgo de que le da miedo a uno que tenga un cáncer en pacientes jóvenes. Ok, recientemente salió una publicación en World Journal Gastroenterology donde relacionan que pacientes con pseudopólipo pueden tener más riesgo de cáncer que pacientes que no tengan pseudopólipo. Sin embargo, el criterio para resecar los pseudopólipos es primero el tamaño, cuando son muy grandes, cuando producen anemia, cuando sangran, es mejor quitarlos, eh, pero no así como que a todo el mundo quitarle todos los pseudopólipos, a veces son incontables y, y quitar todo es difícil. ¿no? En mi práctica clínica yo lo que hago es que el, quito los grandes, los más grandes, pero los, los cortos, los que veo que están como sangrando, que son friables, eso, esos pseudopólipos este, hay que quitarlo. ¿no? Eh, afortunadamente casi nunca eh, eh, es, tienen potencial de, de, de malignizarse, sin embargo, hay que tener en cuenta que a veces en pacientes con colitis ulcerativa eh, te pueden hacer pseudopólipos, pero también te pueden hacer pólipos adenomatosos, ¿no? Entonces, eso sí se puede malignizar y eso sí hay que tener en cuenta eso, ¿no? El aspecto ayuda, pero obviamente la histología también ayuda. No sé, me gustaría qué piensa la pero doctora. Pero hay, hay, esos pacientes muchas veces están, no sangran por su enfermedad, sino por los pol, pseudopólipos en sí. sí Entonces, seguro. a veces... Lo que yo estoy hablando es de cirugía, no estoy hablando de ni de resecarlos, porque básicamente ah, bueno, tendría indicación como, un paciente a una cirugía, una colectomía total, siendo no, que está. Como indicación para colectomía en un paciente que tú no encuentras displasia, que solamente tenga pólipos eh, postinflamatorios, no, no es indicación para realizarle colectomía a, a esos pacientes. No, no sé, la doctora Milly Long quisiera. I agree. Um, the the data are not as clear more recently that pseudopolyps necessarily confer a markedly um, high risk. I, I would intensify surveillance. I would, in that situation, potentially do an annual colonoscopy if you're concerned about the pseudopolyps uh, and potential for malignant transformation. But I wouldn't move straight to colectomy uh, without dysplasia unless, from the patient's perspective, they desired that because of their own concerns. So I agree. I have a question for you, uh, Mili. We, uh, in Portugal, we have many patients that in the screening to start a biologic test positive for IGRA because we are a country that still uh, encounters many tuberculosis. And so my question is, uh, you know, in a patient with IGRA positive, would you favor another biologic uh, besides TNF or, you know, would you kind of just go for the prophylactic treatment and, uh, I mean, of course, generally speaking? I would say it depends on the severity of the IBD. In my practice, for truly severe UC or Crohn's disease with uh, extensive risk factors, fistulizing disease, penetrating disease, upper tract disease, a TNF is the mainstay of therapy. And so in that scenario, I would start on prophylactic treatment, and after at least one month, um, they'll still complete the full nine months of, tre of treatment, but I would start the TNF a month later. For a patient with more moderate disease, yes, I would favor um, ustekinumab or vetalizumab. Bueno, bueno, muchas gracias por las excelentes presentaciones y vamos a terminar entonces con... Una Falta una pregunta para el público. Sí, sí. Eh, el hallazgo incidental de una enfermedad de Crohn durante una colonoscopia de tamizaje eh, modifica de alguna manera el enfoque terapéutico, sobre todo eh, al comienzo de la enfermedad. Hemos tenido un caso reciente, un eh, paciente masculino de 60 años que fue eh, por tamizaje y hemos encontrado una enfermedad de Crohn severa, muy severa, eh, con actividad endoscópica importante y por más de que hemos rehistoriado al paciente, es asintomático. Those are hard. Um... In particular, I usually get mad at myself for looking in the terminal ileum when I probably shouldn't have, and then you find mild Crohn's disease, and then what do you do? Um, 
if it's mild, I monitor. You know, I, I, I follow the patient. I make sure they're not getting anemic. Um, I probably repeat a colonoscopy a little sooner than I would have normally just for colorectal cancer prevention. But for severe disease, that concerns me. I would actually really consider initiating therapy if they have deep ulcers, if they have significant disease. In Crohn's in particular, the symptoms don't necessarily correlate uh, with the inflammatory activity. I might get a biomarker, a calprotectin, and see how, or fecal lactoferrin, and see if there's something you could follow as you initiate treatment to see if they improve since you clearly can't benchmark on symptoms alone. I don't know, Joanna, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I completely agree. I think it's an excellent question. And there is data to suggest that this mild incidental Crohn's, it, uh, the Israel group just published their results. There's, there's also a meta-analysis to show that this mild incidental Crohn's won't progress in the majority of patients. But that it's not the same of the severe patient that may be asymptomatic, but the patient with a severe disease will probably have anemia, will probably, ha probably have elevated biomarkers, and I would approach that patient the same as uh, you know, any other patient with severe disease. Bueno, muchas gracias. Entonces, eh, los invitamos también a participar en los talleres que se están llevando simultáneamente en el Salón La Niña. Para los talleres no requieren eh, estar inscritos previamente, pueden asistir y eh, la, el ingreso es libre.